It's Monday. It's June 17th. And the word of the day is emunctory, which means serving to carry waste out of the body. Used in a sentence, the UK election is underway and should have an emunctory effect Mm -hmm. on the body part. (laughs) Ah, absolutely. We are very much putting the Tory in excretory. (laughs) Or or technically you're getting the Tory out of it, but yeah. Fair, yeah, yep. I'm no illusions. I'm Michael Marshall. I'm Heath Enright. And broadcasting delayed from America and across the pond, we are the Skeptocrats. On this week's episode, Rishi Sunak will show us what the Normandy landing looked like in reverse. (laughs) (laughs) Donald Trump will try his luck with word saying again. And a bombshell revelation in the world of cylindrical food contract law rocks the community. But first, the rest of the intro music. Joining me for headlines tonight are my fellow skeptic rats, Snow Illusions, and Michael Marshall. Gentlemen, great time hanging in Jersey for the PJ party last week. Any favorite moments? Oh, wow. A lot of contenders. I would say my favorite was the time we watched Blackbird with Marsh. No, sorry. The, the other time that we watched Blackbird with Marsh. <laughs> yep, we literally yep. watched Such that movie, movie together two goddamn <laughs> times. We did, and it was fucking great both I times. Amazing. So much. Uh, for me, I think it's either seeing Noah achieve just the platonic form of high after the visit to the weed restaurant. It's either that <laughs> or it's watching Heath and Anne play the game of newlyweds and just reject the premise of a question in precisely the same wording <laughs> it on was like, both of them at the same time. Insane. It was incredible. I felt like the Matrix had glitched. It was so impressive. I was so fucking happy about that. <laughs> like any, any doubts anyone had about their relationship just dried up right there. He's like, you oh, know well, what? I'm yeah. moving in. <laughs> so exciting. <laughs> Anne will not stand for mass-produced chocolate of any kind or milk chocolate in general. She will not do it. <laughs> in our lead story tonight, the Supreme Court got something right in the wrongest possible way last week. The issue in question is the FDA's 24-year-old approval of the abortion pill, Mifepristone. That approval was challenged by a group of anti-choice doctors, and their complaint was upheld by lunatic federal judge Matthew Kasmarek in the Northern District of Texas. After a temporary stay on that ruling, the case finally got heard by the Supreme Court. The correct answer was, go fuck yourself. Mm -hmm. Real doctors get to prescribe medicine. We're done talking about this. The answer we got was the Christian doctors don't technically have legal standing. So they're technically not allowed to complain this time. But maybe if they fill out the paperwork better next time and use the right font or whatever, they can take control over the American uterus in that case. They, They broke and clocked a correct final answer for this, but this was a bad ruling it was yeah yeah and i saw a lot of people cheering this decision like the titanic passengers celebrating that we made it past the iceberg yeah 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 or or they were cheering like they were relieved that the the red laser on the sniper rifle hadn't killed them yeah Yeah. (laughs) no it's harmless guys it's harmless it doesn't even hurt (sighs) yeah so here's a quick background on the relevant laws that led to the ruling and when i say relevant i mean completely absurd and from 1873 Jeez. The previous ruling by Kasmark was based on a law called the Comstock Act of 1873, named after Anthony Comstock, who looks like the, the manscaped man during his time in the Confederate Army. It's not great. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I genuinely didn't realize that the Comstock Act was named after a guy. Because this is America, I assumed Comstock was either the name of a financial fraud scandal or it was some kind of firearms <laughs> accessory. <laughs> <laughs> It might be all that stuff. Mm -hmm. So Comstock is literally one of the worst people in American history. And his contemporaries were other white guys from the Civil War era. (laughs) He stood out for evil amongst that group, even though he fought for the Union Army. As a politician, he crusaded for... Well, everything you might use the word crusade to achieve. Not okay, great. yeah, no, that, that does sound pretty American, actually. Yeah. He, was yeah. Pre- yeah. he was pretty American. He was very crusade That includes preventing voting rights for anyone who's not a white guy with land, ending masturbation and porn because he hates joy, and acting as a contraceptive against contraception. Also, probably genociding heathens in a crusade, like if he could get the votes. I don't know, probably. And the Comstock Act 
made it illegal to send pornography through the mail, among other things. That included at the time the Canterbury Tales. <laughs> well, I'm, who hasn't rubbed one out to the merchant's tail? Am I right? I mean... <laughs> okay, f- fair enough. Withdrawn. <laughs> so the Comstock Act also banned the mailing of any substance or object that might prevent or end a pregnancy. Again, that was 1873. So Judge Kasmarek was sitting in Texas trying to figure out a legal thing in 2023, and he flipped back through the law books for 140 years, kept going for 10 more years because (laughs) 1883 was too woke, and he ruled that Mifepristone can't be transported, so it's effectively banned. Right, or or you have to go to the Mifepristone factory and, like, stand there with your mouth under the conveyor belt. (laughs) Okay, but, I mean, you're assuming that the judge wouldn't throw that conveyor belt in jail. I don't think we can make that assumption. (laughs) Oh, right, yeah. Very good point. That's transport, too. So, the ruling from our nation's highest court last week was written by the Honorable Justice Brett Kavanaugh who has a friend named Squee with whom he enjoys boofing. And (laughs) it reluctantly admitted that choices made by the owner of a uterus and their doctor have nothing to do with some other Christian doctor who's mad about it. The ruling said, quote, the FDA is not requiring plaintiffs to do or refrain from doing anything. Right. Rather, the plaintiffs want the FDA to make Mifepristone more difficult for other doctors to prescribe and for pregnant people to obtain. Under Article 3 of the Constitution, a plaintiff's desire to make a drug less available for others does not establish standing to sue. End oh, quote. I bet he had to physically restrain himself from adding the word unfortunately to that last sentence, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. It was there in the subtext. Yeah, and then followed by yet. But, you know, Sotomayor is not getting any younger, so just put a pin in it for yeah, now. Yeah, right. <sighs> and here's a few more arguments from the anti-choice doctors. Again, these got rejected, but... Nowhere near aggressively enough. Way too polite. The Christian doctors claimed they were the victims of direct injury to their consciences by being forced to prescribe the abortion pill. So the court asked, who did who did that happen to? Who got forced to, I don't know, punch himself in the conscience and prescribe that? And the answer was nobody from the plaintiffs. They had zero examples. So that was helpful for the ruling that they had zero examples. But I'd love it if it didn't feel like the Supreme Court was providing an answer key for how to remove bodily autonomy in future lawsuits. Right. Yeah, this isn't so much jurisprudence by this point as it is Socratic teaching. You know, they might as well have ended that with, (laughs) so what have we learned? (laughs) Right. (laughs) Terrifying. Also, we should be forcing doctors to prescribe whatever a patient needs. We are doing that with pretty much everything that's not, you know, lady medicine. Doctors have to doctor. That should not be an answer for the answer key, right. but it felt like it might be. Yes, right. Look, if a vegan waiter doesn't want to serve the steak at the steakhouse, they get a different fucking job. We already have a fix for this. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And <laughs> obviously, fuck yourself. This, this doesn't happen in any other area of medicine. You know, doctors, right. doctors don't get to refuse to do colonoscopies because of their religious prohibition against butt stuff. <laughs> yet, yet. Well, Marsh, you're putting stuff in the ether, man. Okay. So, yeah, somehow the other arguments from the plaintiffs were actually even dumber than that one. They also said they were injured by the FDA because the legalization of Mifepristone forced a bunch of Christian liars to spend time and money on bullshit studies that tried to claim the drug is too dangerous. It's not. <laughs> They also spent time and money doing big propaganda campaigns, and (laughs) that wasn't fair that they had to do that. Wait, so their legal argument is the truth made it really expensive for me to lie good? (laughs) That's That's exactly one of the arguments they made. And my personal favorite, they argued that they do have legal standing because nobody else has legal standing. (laughs) Seriously? Mm. They tried to claim that nobody's allowed to file this lawsuit Therefore, somebody has to be allowed to follow oh. this lawsuit. <laughs> well, how about we leave it to one of those aborted feet? Oh, shit. Yeah, no, I see. It. I get it. I see. It. Yeah. Okay. So, Marsh, you got a little terrifying peek into our legal system here. If insane Christian people want to do a theocracy thing, they go to a big, dusty wasteland of pre post apocalyptic Texas, Texas, and <laughs> file a lawsuit there. 
That absurd place in North Texas has exactly one federal judge, currently Matthew Kasmarek, nominated by Donald Trump, and the Christian zealots are guaranteed to get a ruling by that guy specifically. And the only way to stop that from becoming federal law is to get the Supreme Court to call an emergency timeout on insane rulings from Amarillo, Texas, that somehow affect every uterus in the country, even though Amarillo, Texas and surrounding areas don't fucking matter. So luckily, that timeout actually happened last year, but it left us relying on the current Supreme Court to fix the problem. And they landed on, you know, good try. Maybe rewrite your essay with better standing. We, we gave you some helpful tips on that. And we'll take another look at your theocracy next time. That's the so-called good news from the mm-hmm. Supreme Court. Also, they made machine guns legal for everyone last yep. week, too. Yep. Right. But of course it did. So, like, they banned you know, abortion and contraception, but they did make it easier for kids to die in school shootings. Oh, so- <laughs> For Republicans, the window in which life is sacred just keeps getting narrower and <laughs> right, narrower. Right, yeah. Uh-huh. Okay, they're being consistent, Marsh. They're killing fetuses and people this week. It's <laughs> consistent? God. And uh, speaking of cutting the cord, we're going to take a quick break for a word from our sponsor, Mint Mobile. Hey, Heath. What's with the test tube in the Petri dish? I'm re-engineering the passenger pigeon, Noah. I'm angered that the formula demands that I now ask why. Okay, have you seen wireless rates these days? Forget that. I'm going back. Gonna text like it was 1913. I don't I don't think passenger pigeons were still in use in 19... 19- the last known Ectopistes migratorius died in 1914, Noah. Her name was Martha. What a fun fact. But Heath, instead of Jurassic parking passenger pigeons back to life, why don't you just try Mint Mobile? Because Ryan Reynolds can't fly, Noah. No, I I mean getting your wireless service through Mint Mobile. See, Mint Mobile's secret sauce is that they sell wireless service online, which means they don't have retail stores or salespeople. That allows them to offer the same high-speed unlimited talk and text on the nation's largest 5G network, and they're able to do it for a lot less. Like, how much less? Mint Mobile has wireless plans starting at just 15 bucks a month. 15 bucks a month? That's impossible, really? You'd think, but I've been using Mint Mobile for years now, and it's true. And it's actually more reliable than my old provider, and it's a lot less expensive. All right, I'm sold. Where do I sign up? To get this new customer offer and your new three-month unlimited wireless plan for just 15 bucks a month, go to mintmobile.com slash skeptocrat. That's mintmobile.com slash skeptocrat. Cut your wireless bill to 15 bucks a month at mintmobile.com slash skeptocrat. $45 upfront payment required, equivalent to $15 a month. New customers on first three-month plan only. Speed slower, about 40 gigabytes on unlimited plan. Additional taxes, fees, and restrictions apply. See Mint Mobile for details. Great. I guess I'll give them a try. Cool. I, I, so, so how does how does the ad end? Oh, yeah. I don't know. Eli usually writes them. I don't know what he does. So, so one of us... So should should one of us die? Die, yeah. Probably die. And we're back. Next up in headlines in VETA Runaway News... If if you think my voice sounds somehow different today, like in a way that you can't quite put your finger on, don't worry. Don't adjust your headphone settings. This is just how I sound when I've got hope. And I know it, it's weird. <laughs> you've just you've not heard me this way before, but it's finally, finally election season here in the UK. And, you know, not a, a local election either. We're talking the election, the proper election, the big one. This this is me at my giddiest. You know, drink this in. Set this as your ringtone if you like. <laughs> and and if you're wondering what Heath and I sound like when we have hope, so are we. <laughs> okay, I think I did a hope in the early '90s once. I don't remember it. Speci- I remember it being fun, but I don't remember what happened. Oh, it is fun. It is fun. So the thing is, every election campaign, it's always going to have its tricky points. But there's some staples that are just impossible to fuck up, right? Like you kiss the baby, you travel to a rural place and patronise the local food, and you pay respect to the troops. That's the easy part of running for office, which is why it is to absolutely nobody's surprise that Rishi Sunak is treating every one of these open goals with the grace, skill and composure of Dinah Ross during the 1994 World Cup opening ceremony. <laughs> Sorry, there's an international football tournament underway. I can only think in soccer metaphors right so now. so bad. Oh, listeners, Marsh's hyperlink, this old, grainy fucking 
<laughs> 16-pixel version of it in the show notes. If you have not seen this before, seek it out. Imagine somebody trying to throw out the first pitch and accidentally sticking the ball up their own ass. <laughs> <laughs> And then singing a song for 60,000 people with a ball inside your ass. <laughs> yes, yes. Oh, it's beautiful. <laughs> they, they had her try to shoot a penalty shot. And then the goal was supposed to, like, explode. They had it set up to, like, break it apart. But she missed the goal entirely. So, much, so they, like, explode so the goal with it was, nothing. She kicked it left. Amazing. Just left. Straight to the left. <laughs> oh. And speaking of football, Rishi Sunak opened his uh, his electoral campaign by heading to a meet and greet in Wales, where he very cheerily asked the locals how much they're looking forward to the European Championships this summer, which was a bit of a sore spot given that Wales didn't qualify for <laughs> oh, that tournament. No. <laughs> oh, you guys didn't make it. How about that Aberfan mine, right? <laughs> <laughs> we laughing? Yeah. <laughs> Welcome to Wrexham, am I right? <laughs> <laughs> um, guys? So after that, the very next day, Sunak went to Belfast to launch his campaign there at the dock where the Titanic was built. That's the what? only thing that it's famous for is building the Titanic. <laughs> Jesus so cue the obvious question from a journalist about him captaining a sinking ship. <laughs> and presumably, like, the next on-the-nose press conference would have been at a local swimming pool where he'd have been, like, floating belly up and out of his depth while his team <laughs> threw in the towel. I assume that was next on the plan. <laughs> I'm glad to see your elections are hiring our elections writers now. Yours are getting a bit <laughs> stiff, I gotta admit. Okay, Marsh, this is very important. Any chance there's a place outside London called Buckingham Palace Total Landscape? <laughs> we can do something with that. Uh, there will be within 20 minutes of us finishing recording. I'm setting that up. <laughs> Money in the bank. Um, but then it comes to the veterans, okay? Because as the Prime Minister of the UK, Sunak was invited to take part in an event to mark the 80th anniversary of D-Day, where he could get to look all statesman-like as he met with the last surviving members of the World War II troops on what is pretty much likely to be the final big anniversary they'll still be present for. And it was just a gilt-edged opportunity to look very respectful in photo ops, to stand next to world leaders and look the part. Or it would have been if Sunak had been there. But he wasn't, because he left that event early, before the international leaders part of it, so he could do a campaign interview with ITV Such News. piece of shit. Yeah, and it was actually a campaign interview which opened with him complaining that he was late for the interview because the whole D-Day thing took too long and the oh, celebrations had over <laughs> Fucking D-Day. <laughs> Classic mistake, man. You should have told him you had bone spurs. <laughs> <laughs> More like Vichy. Sunak. Oh, that is good. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> France uh, occupied so by Germany. What is what is actually somehow even worse is that the only reason he was doing this interview was so Sunak could deny being a liar after he repeatedly lied in his election debate with Keir Starmer a few days earlier. So in order to put out that particular fire, he gave the middle finger to the last surviving soldiers who fought the Nazis. You know, it's not so much out of the frying pan into the fire as it is setting the frying pan on fire and then trying to use that flaming frying pan to put out a different fire. <laughs> it's like as if his whole election campaign is a political homage to the meme of Sideshow Bob stepping on rakes everywhere he goes. <laughs> but still... I did that I, once, it hurts. So bad. <laughs> but still, and like, I, I genuinely cannot believe I'm saying this, Sunak honestly could have done worse... Because that wasn't even the biggest election campaign based D-Day fuck up of that week. Someone really? actually That's a very specific him. thing. Yeah, yeah. And they still outdid him on that niche thing. Because that accolade goes to the former Brexit party, which is now headed up by Nigel Farage and renamed Reform UK. Uh, whose name, by the way, gets shortened in all of the polls to REF UK. Like, we fuck. <laughs> because they fucked us once with Brexit and now they're trying to refuck us with this party. <laughs> I'm, I, as a member of a political party that's still sticking with the jackass mascot two centuries later, I don't like. I don't know that I have room to talk, but that is funny. <laughs> yeah, why are we still rolling with the donkey? I don't know. A lot of liberals going to get mad about rebranding away from Andrew Jackson's 1828 right. presidential campaign to genocide more Native Americans, <laughs> I'm pretty sure. Let, let's just lean in and make the mascot like... A, a trophy hunter with an elephant gun, maybe Ooh, something like that. I feel like, I like Republicans would get super confused. They'd they'd be like, "I I like the gun thing, but that's 
That's <laughs> us, I think. Sorry, I'm getting off track. Marsh, you were talking about how the neo-Nazis are losing in your delightful election. I, I, I was talking about how they were fucking up. I didn't say they were losing. One poll put them in second place. It's a bad poll, but they were in second place at one point. But no, so just days after Sunak's Normandy disbanding, we found out that one of Reform's candidates had, apropos of nothing, explained that the UK would have been, quote, far better if it had taken Hitler up on his offer of neutrality. Fucking what? Seriously? <laughs> And even wilder than that, when pressed for comments about this pro-appeasement stance, Reform's official spokesperson explained that it was probably true and that the view was, quote, shared by the vast majority of the British establishment, unquote. What the fuck is happening? Yeah, honestly. Say what you will about the tenants. <laughs> it, it is exactly that. Yeah, Jesus. Honestly, it's as if someone had said that if it wasn't for D-Day, we'd all be speaking German now. And then Reform had responded to that point in order to say, well, actually, it's quite rewarding to speak a second language. <laughs> <laughs> Think about how many fewer national capitals you'd have to remember, guys, huh? Yeah. Okay, but Marsh, you might still have an EU passport, right? They're not mm. entirely right. Like, it's not entirely bad. Oh, God, this is why they're in second place. This is why they're in second place. <laughs> <laughs> and look, my tournament bracket for this election did not contain a prime minister who thinks he shouldn't have been at Normandy versus a far right party who countered that by saying nobody should ever have been on the beach at Normandy because we should have just appeased the Nazis. And we are only three weeks into this campaign. Right. We've got three more weeks to go. Right. This plus an England win at the Euros. This could be on course for the best summer of my life at this point. <laughs> And in vax evasion news, the <laughs> propaganda is coming from inside the House. That was the findings of an investigative report by Reuters that uncovered a months-long government-sponsored online anti-vax campaign that Trump started to sow unfounded fear about China's COVID vaccine. This campaign involved thousands of anonymous Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram accounts that targeted the Philippines with messages questioning the safety of the Sinovac inoculation, as well as the effectiveness of PPE originating in China. They also targeted Middle Eastern countries with false claims that the vaccine contained pork gelatin and was thus haram, because no matter how bad you think America is, it's always worse. So evil. Okay, so th this is obviously bad, but... I can't be the only one just a little impressed that Trump knew what the Philippines were. Right? <laughs> like, either that or he spent this whole time thinking he was paying to lie to Queen Elizabeth's husband. It could have been that. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> okay, this gives us a crazy look into Donald Trump's stupid fucking brain. So he was picturing epidemiologists creating a vaccine and he's picturing them being like, yeah, still not working. Or I tried like... The eye of Newt. I'm going to toss a few pig bones into the cauldron that we have. <laughs> that should spice it up, make the vaccine work. He ended up getting it kind of right, I suppose, but he got lucky. He got yeah. lucky on that. Yeah. And also, Marsh, I'm sure he outsources this geography. Come on. Okay, um, that's so, bad. <laughs> so, yeah. So, obviously, the first question here is why the fuck we would do that? And the answer is that we're evil, right? Like, like honestly, if we had done this so that Pfizer and Moderna would have an edge in the market, that would have been less evil than the real reason. Because in that instance, at least somebody was making some money off of it. But no, <laughs> this was because we were afraid that China would look good if they showed up with an effective vaccine before we did. That's the official reason, like so much as anybody's commented on this shit officially. And while this is entirely speculative, I feel like Trump's desire for somebody other than America to lead the world in per capita COVID deaths factored in heavily. Right, yeah, because he couldn't rely on his old method to make the numbers look better because they confiscated his Sharpie pen after that whole hurricane thing. No, but right, yeah, exactly. <laughs> now, you may recall that American pharmaceutical companies actually beat China to a vaccine by quite a bit, but our national policy, as ever, was, fuck the rest of the world, I got mine, which is why the Sinovac <laughs> vaccine was the first vaccine available in the Philippines, despite the fact that it didn't come out until almost a year after the Pfizer vaccine was approved. Oh, okay, like how we used to get the bootleg action figures long before the movie was ever released over here. You know, returning home from the market mm. with my adolescent hero Terrapin toy. Yeah, uh, my, mine was called Rembrandt. <laughs> he he carried a pitchfork. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Okay, but at least it wasn't Donatello. <laughs> Gross. Now, of course, just because. We're the bad guys doesn't mean China isn't also the bad guys here. They, they only made Sinovac available to the Philippines once they'd agreed to territorial concessions in the South China what Sea. Fuck. <laughs> Which means they had a meeting about that. Yeah. To negotiate. Mm. 
in a fucking volcano layer. That must right. be with yes. like bagels and donuts and right. like sliding papers across tables. Jesus. Yeah, but regardless, the end result was that the country riding to the rescue wasn't wearing red, white, and blue, so we decided to murder Filipinos with disinformation. Okay, but honestly, that still beats America's previous interventions in East Asia. Okay. Like Vietnam and Cambodia would have loved to have been carpet disinformed. <laughs> no, that's fair. Yeah. <laughs> uh, look, and as bad as what we were doing was, we were also really bad at doing it, apparently. This campaign was run out of the Military Psychological Operations Center in Tampa, Florida, and within a few weeks of them starting it, Facebook caught them. They uncovered a series <laughs> of suspicious accounts sharing misinformation and pretty much immediately traced it back to Tampa's MacDill Air Force Base. All thousands of them. So, so they called the government and they were like, hey guys, um, well first of all, stop it, but also, like, secondly, and just as importantly... Be better at it in the first place. Our fucking interns shouldn't be able to thwart a top secret U.S. psyops campaign. Yeah, especially when those interns were primarily busy ensuring not a single American gets to see a nipple. Yeah. Right, yeah. <laughs> you guys got to stop making memes with ivermectin and nipples. How is that even helpful? What are you doing? Okay, never mind. I heard it. I heard it. Just yep. stop. Though. Stop doing that. Now, if Facebook is a corporation, right, so they're evil too, uh, they did not shut down the accounts even after they identified him as part of a deadly misinformation campaign. Uh, but they did tell the government to stop using them to spread disinformation about vaccines, specifically, uh, which the government, for their part, didn't. So a few months later, they had to come back and tell him again. Uh, but by now, the Biden administration had taken over. So Facebook called and said, hey, you know those thousands of fake accounts you were using to murder Filipinos with uh, misinformation about vaccines? And they said, what the fuck are you talking about? And shut what? the program down. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, or, or sorry, no, they didn't shut the program down. They pivoted it to a less deadly form of misinformation. Right. They were like, well, this is pretty oh. good. Like we have a, some good lying going here. But they, but they did so from a pro vaccine position. Cool. Yeah. You got to taper the propaganda. It's like a smoking patch. That's yeah, right. No, exactly. Right. <laughs> And like I said, th this program expanded far beyond the Philippines. Uh, basically, every country that China was offering vaccines to was getting the same treatment. And that included a lot of Muslim countries. Uh, so, like, one of the most common lies that they spread involves pork gelatin in the vaccines. And while it's true that pork gelatin is sometimes used in the manufacture of vaccine, it's not true that it was used in the Sinovac vaccine. Um, it's also not true that uh, it would be haram if it did, right? Like, Muslim religious authorities are pretty much unified on the fact that you get to call a timeout on pig stuff if lives are at stake, right? Like, a Muslim is allowed to eat bacon if the alternative is starvation, uh, now, of course, one could argue pretty convincingly that a bacon-free life isn't really a life at all and that all bacon <laughs> consumption is life-saving, but I'll leave that argument to Muslim Heath. <laughs> Muslim Heath. Like, no pork, no booze, no gambling, no interest allowed from investment. There is no yeah. way Muslim Heath has survived long right, enough to no, tell that story. that's fair, yeah, right. Um, it's falafel? I like I can live on falafel for a long time. Now, stuff. It's also worth pointing out, by the way, uh, that there were safeguards in place meant to keep this shit from happening. Uh, by law, if the military wants to do a PSYOP on a foreign population, they need to run it by the State Department for approval unless we're at war with that country. Um, and, and sure, it's fucked up that institutionally lying to foreigners has a procedure at all, but welcome to Earth, right? Um, anyway, in this instance, the State Department strongly objected to the program, so then Secretary of Defense Mark Esper signed a secret order that elevated competition with China and Russia to the priority level of active combat. So... For all intents and purposes, the Trump administration secretly declared war on China and Russia so that they could lie to people better. Yikes. Yes. And the guy that spearheaded that, by the way, is leading in the fucking polls. What uh, is happening? I, well, and speaking of how we're all going to die, let's take a quick break for a word from our other sponsor this week, Trust and Will. One party poker branded whiskey decanter one Party Poker branded wine carafe, and two Comic-Con exclusive Joker action figures. Mint in box. Hey, Heath. Nice. You, you naming your possessions out loud to yourself? D well, y yes, but I'm, I'm just cataloging my estate. I'm making sure Anne and Kai are all set when I'm gone. But Anne has a real job, and your stuff is dumb. These are investments, Noah. It's all about the time horizon. You gotta hodl. That's the Don't key. Don't say a hodl. Got a hodl. But if you or Anne with grown-up stuff want to get peace of mind for you and your loved ones, why don't you just try trust and will? 
Oh, what's Trust and Will? Trust and Will lets you create and manage a custom estate plan starting at just $199. And I'm told they're great. A friend of mine used Trust and Will, and she said their site was simple and straightforward, and she was able to set up a state-specific will that was customized to her needs, including care wishes, guardians, final arrangements, and power of attorney. It's no wonder that Trust and Will has been used by hundreds of thousands of families to make their assets and wishes secure. All right, I'm sold. Where do I go? Secure your assets and protect your loved ones with Trust and Will. Get 10% off plus free shipping of your estate plan documents by visiting trustandwill.com slash skeptocrat. That's 10% off and free shipping at trustandwill.com slash skeptocrat. Sounds great. Hey, you know what's nice? What, what's that? So normally for this bit, Eli would have me setting up a will that dictates what happens when I like choke on a handful of grated Parmesan and nobody's there to save me. And I try to call 911, but a fey demon named after a shoe turns my phone into bees and I die in pain. But thanks to Ann and Kai, my sad, lonely, tragic persona, it doesn't really work anymore for sketches. Yeah. Yeah, it's actually really sweet that you're thinking about Ann and Kai and their future. Yeah, that's what love's all about, right? Exactly. Exactly. Thinking of others. Ruining the vibes for Eli's Sketchiverse. No, it, it, and your thing, too, with the loving and caring, for sure. No, actually, considering the assets that you were cataloging, I'm guessing Anne's way happier about spiting Eli. They're mint in box, those things. But yeah, no, she she loves spiting Eli. She does. And she does not want my stuff. No, nobody, nobody wants your Do you stuff. want? You don't? Okay, you're saying no right away. And we're back. Next up in headlines, in Dog Eat Dog World News, we have a tragic, tragic story about one of the greatest athletes of all time being banned from competition. World champion, Joey Chestnut, the Lionel Messi <laughs> of eating hot dogs, has been officially banned from this year's Nathan's Hot Dog Eating Contest, the World Cup of Competitive Eating. It's a sad time for the entire community. Okay, but a joyous time for all the pig anuses and cow intestines that will now go competitively <laughs> uneaten. Yeah, I'll, I'll have you know... Marsh, that the Nathan's hot dog is 100% beef. Thank so, you. So cow anuses. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so according to Nathan's, Mr. Chestnut was banned because he signed a sponsorship deal with a rival hot dog brand. And to make it even worse, they're not even hot dogs. They're vegan hot dogs. So, so actually, like, way less problematic and disgusting. But mm -hmm. traditional... <laughs> Hot dog purists are furious, including Nathan's. He made a deal with Impossible Foods to endorse their plant-based soy tubes. <laughs> and as a recent convert to a lot of Impossible Meats, I feel like the name is an admission as to why they fell so far short, right? <laughs> it's like, all right, yeah, but if it tasted like a hot dog, that would be impossible, right? It says so right on the package. <laughs> <laughs> so just in case anyone's not familiar with the spectacular world of competitive eating, I'll give you a little background. It's revolting and majestic, yeah. though, at the same time. Oh. And it's exactly what America is all about. I'm never more patriotic. It's people <laughs> shoving way too much food into their face in short periods of time and then making sure they don't vomit until after the official vomit timer runs out, which usually extends a bit beyond the official eating timer. Oh, God, I don't know if the vomit timer is a device or a person, and I genuinely can't decide which would be more depressing. Like, at least if it's a person, you're giving someone a job, I guess. <laughs> so, it is a sad statement on humanity in general that when somebody said, well, now we, we're going to need a vomit timer, nobody said, well, then let's not do this. What if we just don't? <laughs> It's job creation for the timer guy. So that being said, most high-level professionals actually don't vomit after the contest at all because it's good practice for the next event to not vomit. And also, it's unhealthy to vomit. You know, that doesn't matter what you're a professional at. Like, most high-level professionals don't vomit after their contest. That's, period, right. That's very true. And you wouldn't want to do anything unhealthy after eating several dozen hot dogs. <laughs> and them in the so, so for the Nathan's contest... Competitors get 10 minutes to eat as many hot dogs and buns as they can, along with beverages and condiments as they see fit. They usually have water and skip the condiments. Oh, but I really want like some showboater to insist on having a large portion of fries to accompany it. <laughs> <laughs> you do get some showboaters, actually. So there's a weirdly aggressive dispute about what 
technically counts as the original Nathan's hot dog eating event, but the first one in what I call the modern open era <laughs> with, with the 10 to 12 minute format was in 1979. <laughs> and the winners tied with 10 hot dogs in 10 minutes plus three and a half hot dogs each during a tiebreaker. Since then, the sport has come so far. Hang on, that's not a tiebreaker. If they both no, have three and a no. half hot dogs. No, they didn't break the ties. <laughs> they were like, do another three and a half minutes. Just, and they just, had just exactly another three and the half same hot amount dogs. of hot dogs. Yeah, the granularity <laughs> is eighths of hot dogs, by the way. Yeah, so three and four eighths. And the person who deserves the credit for bringing the sport so far, for bringing the sport to the world stage, is Takeru Kobayashi. Of Japan, ooh ooh, in two thousand one, in ooh ooh, indeed. <laughs> I can't ooh ooh because my voice doesn't do that anymore. I smoke too much, yeah. but I'll just ooh. Give it ooh, ooh. I can't ooh ooh because one, I'm British, and two, this is about hot dog eating. I'm not going to break up. <laughs> ooh, 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 I'm sorry. Fair enough, but this guy's awesome. <laughs> in two thousand one, Kobayashi burst onto the hot dog scene at the Nathan's contest and demolished the existing record of twenty five and one eighth hot dogs set the previous year, and he ate a whopping. 50 hot dogs. Oh my God, that's too and, many hot dogs. Yeah. Unlike the majority of the field, consisting of mostly quite large people, Kobayashi is five foot eight inches tall and he weighed 128 pounds at the time. And his secret was a special technique that he calls clearing. Instead of just eating the hot dogs and buns normally, he'd pull the hot dog out of the bun, actually two at a time, he'd eat them by themselves and then dip the buns in water and eat the buns wet. Yeah, in case it wasn't already disgusting enough to look at, you got to watch him eat yeah. wet bread. <laughs> it's oh, gross. God. He is an innovator in the field of making something that was already gross so many times grosser. Like, he deserves a <laughs> Nobel Prize for lowering that floor so much further. He also <laughs> lost to a bear in competition one time. His first competitive loss was to a bear. <laughs> really? <laughs> that is a very fun fact. So, Kobayashi quickly became a global sensation and competitive eating exploded in popularity. We now have an organization called Major League Eating, the MLE, and they oversee a world tour of events every year, including the Nathan's Contest. Okay, so you'll take Hot Dog Eating International, but your World Series of Baseball is still very much just your one corner of the world. <laughs> Cowards, okay. the lot of you. So, so first of all, we let Canada play too. Secondly... A little bit. Well, well yeah, it's like a one. So, secondly, though, we would be more than happy to let England field a team next year too, for whatever that's <laughs> worth, Marsh. <laughs> Fuck you, we can cricket now, man. You can't talk that shit about true. us. That is true. Yeah, that is very true. <laughs> in cricket you're terrified about that group yeah so kobayashi went on to win the next five nathan's events in a row a six peat in total and pushed the record number to 53 and three quarters 53 and six eighths hot dogs in 2006 people said he could never be beaten but people were wrong and to the man the myth the legend joseph Christian Chestnut of San Jose, California. Lydia Smith is a huge fan of the fact that he's from San Jose, <laughs> California. It made a big deal <laughs> That's true. It. In 2007, he put down 66 hot dogs Jesus. and handed Kobayashi his first ever loss at the Nathan's event. Chestnut would go on to win a total of 16 more, including the 2021 contest, during which he set the current world record with 76 hot dogs in 10 minutes. But sadly, Major League Eating will not allow him to compete for a 17th win this year. They issued a statement on Twitter last week saying they're, quote, devastated by Chestnut's decision to endorse a rival brand, which they did not name, only saying, <laughs> quote, it sells plant-based hot dogs. And Nathan's released a statement that called Chestnut, quote, an American hero, adding that they went to great lengths to attempt to accommodate their hero, even agreeing to an appearance fee and also allowing him to compete in an upcoming unsanctioned, unbranded contest <laughs> later this year. They were going to let him compete in an off-the-books event? That sounds so shady, like he's meeting Brad Pitt in a ring in Ireland and challenging him to hit, eat hot dogs to win a caravan or something. Yeah. Bare knuckle hot dog eating. Yeah, yeah exactly, right. yeah. Incidentally, bare knuckle is one of the constituent ingredients in a hot dog. Oh, it's cow knuckles, Marsh. We've been over that. Thank you, Noah. And that brings us to another 
huge, monumental piece of news in the competitive eating community. For context, Kobayashi hasn't competed at the Nathan's Contest since 2009, following a ban before the 2010 event due to a similar controversy involving a contract dispute. Ever since, we've all been waiting for another showdown between Kobayashi and Chestnut. But during an appearance in a documentary earlier this year, Kobayashi announced his retirement from the sport. He's hanging up his whatever bib or something. <laughs> However, he's going to do one more <gasps> event, and we just found out about it. That unsanctioned, unbranded event that I mentioned before is actually a live Netflix gorge tackler, <laughs> and we'll get to see Chestnut and Kobayashi settle the score once and for all. It's called Chestnut versus Kobayashi Unfinished Beef. Nice. It's on September 2nd. <laughs> get fucking excited. And in election selection and rejection section news, the nice. great thing about UK elections is that we don't elect prime ministers. We vote on local politicians, and then the party which wins the most regional elections gets to choose who gets to be prime minister, which means that we don't get just one election campaign. We get several hundred all at once. And when you've got a Tory party as incompetent and universally hated as this current one, it means that every single day just brings a fresh new set of conservative humiliations. <laughs> it's going really bad. Zero out of ten downing would not recommend it. <laughs> <laughs> I was I was tempted to make a joke here about how dumb it is to not directly elect your national leader. And then I remember how bad that went for us in 2016, and I gave up. I didn't know that <laughs> So an early favorite in all of this for me was an interview with Danny Kruger MP, who explained that if people are looking for a change, they'll find that change with the Tory party, because what, a really? vote for Labour represents more of the same and a continuation of the failed state. Only the Tories will deliver change which is an amazing electoral strategy in that he was literally saying, if you elect the other guys, they might carry on doing the terrible things we've spent the last 14 years doing. But if you elect us, we might stop. <laughs> right. Just like, look, you learn from your mistakes. They've made far fewer mistakes. We're ahead. <laughs> okay. But then just a few days later, that was topped by Tory MP Lucy Adams advising the people of Telford they should vote for Alan Adams, who it's worth pointing out is no relation and is even more worth pointing out, is from a different party. Lucy Adams was kicked out of the Tory party for endorsing the wrong party. She endorsed the Reform Party. And if you want to get a feel for who Lucy Adams is, in 2015, she posted to Facebook a death threat that she'd received via email, only to later admit she'd added the words, unless you die, to the end of an email that Come otherwise on. wasn't a death threat. It wasn't a death threat until she added that to the email herself. So she's going to be a great loss to the Tory party and to the entire country. <laughs> well, unless she dies. <laughs> <laughs> and then after that, there was the genuine joy of seeing the Tory candidate, Ed McGuinness, proudly posing on Twitter outside of his brand new house in his prospective constituency and explaining that people, quote, rightly expect their MP to be a part of their community, which is why he is, as of today, a resident of St Paul's Ward, unquote. Only for a community note to, on that tweet to point out that the house that he's proudly moving into is an Airbnb. <laughs> <laughs> so good. He ends the press conference, tries to walk inside, but there's a keypad with the door. <laughs> Everybody, leave now. Don't I'm look. gonna. Don't look. I'm so, going in the window for exercise. Just don't look. <laughs> so, by his same logic, we were all eligible to replace Bob Menendez as senator for the entirety <laughs> of last week. Well, yeah, don't say that too loud, or Jersey will take us up on the offer. Most. <laughs> Happily, but then still, none of that comes close to a beautiful and soul-enriching clip from a campaign event by the incumbent MP for Tatton in Cheshire, Esther McVeigh. Because in the video, McVeigh explains that the Conservative Party, quote, always gets the country back on its feet, unquote. At which point, <laughs> the entire audience of her potential voters erupts in laughter. Honestly, it's the kind of laugh that if you got it at a live show, you'd consider ending the show there because you're not going to top that laugh. <laughs> Except in her case, the laughter was at the very idea that she and her party as a whole have even a modicum of competence. Okay, the guy next to her in this video, I watched it, Marsh gave us a link. The guy next to her took a sip of water 
right before she said that. Mm. And he has to work so fucking hard not to do a full spit take right into her face. <laughs> well, it's the best. And just consider what she's saying here, right? Like, okay, they're in charge now, right? So yes. if they always got the country back on its feet, it would be on its fucking feet. Right, like they wouldn't need someone to get it on. It's fuck. Of course, everybody was laughing. That's insane. Unless her argument is, it takes fifteen years to get the country back. Well, in right, yes. like we're right on the cusp. We're almost there. Uh, and McVeigh, it's worth pointing out, will be particularly satisfying to see the back of. Uh, she was the MP that was appointed as Rishi Sunak's Minister for Common Sense, and she was charged with leading the government's anti-woke agenda. And her first act in this kind of unofficial, semi-official role was to announce that she wanted to tackle, quote, the left-wing, politically correct, woke warriors in the public sector by banning civil servants from wearing rainbow lanyards to work. Because the very clear threat to the stability of the UK is obviously the colour palette of the string that people use to display their ID cards. And mm. I, I guess this is what they mean by identity politics. <laughs> I'm curious what they meant by common sense. <laughs> and all of us, all of this is just going so spectacularly badly for the Tories. And I am here for it all the way. All of the polls by this point are borderline pornographic. And... I, I didn't think that at 40 years old, I'd discover that my kink is statistical data charting demographic flight away from a dying Tory party. (laughs) But here we are. (laughs) Marsh, you should have asked me years ago. I could have told you about your kink for sure. (laughs) (laughs) We could have got weird together in Jersey. Yeah, this opportunity. (laughs) Yeah, no, mine is statistical data charting demographic flight away from a dying Christian church, Marsh. So at least we could have done some back to back stuff, right? Like there's, there's something there. And so I'm not going to share. Gone too- eyes locked, Marsh. Eyes <laughs> locked. And I'm I'm not going to share too many of the polls, but my favourite was one from Public First, which found that among people who voted Tory at the last election in 2019, 24% agreed with the statement: the Tories deserve to lose every seat they have. One in four Tory voters. And and bear in mind, that's not even saying that a quarter of Tory voters think the Tories should lose. It's saying those are the ones who think the Tories ought to get zero seats in this election. (laughs) So, uh, Marsh, I made a visualization of this. (laughs) Put it in the notes. Go ahead and get in there, man. It is. It's beautiful. It is beautiful. Don't be shy. Don't be shy, buddy. (laughs) It's Parliament with all labor pretty much there's, there's, there's a little bit of lib dem there a little bit of uh yeah. smp a just of to balance things in there i don't know it was because that's how it's i just moved a shit all, Why the, not? i moved all the red and blue to red spice things red up good. spice things yeah. up <laughs> <laughs> so the only downside to any of this is that 75 sitting tory mps have decided to stand down rather than risk a humiliating and inevitable defeat so we won't get to watch them get ritually humiliated on the campaign trail But it's worth pointing out that the Tories who are fleeing the party include some of their biggest hitters, Michael Gove, Chris Grayling, Sajid Javid, Matt Hancock, Kwasi Kwarteng, Andrea Leadsom, Theresa May, Dominic Raab and Nadeem Zahawi. So in that selection alone, there's four former justice ministers, three chancellors, which is which is the equivalent of treasurer, um, two home secretaries, two health secretaries and a former prime minister in there. And they're all quitting because they know they're fucked. Like, five of that bunch ran for Tory leader in 2019. Three years ago, they thought they could run run this thing, and now they're running away. Two of them lost to Sunak and Truss in 2022. Amazing. Well, and and you could make the argument, of course, that cowering in your corner and refusing to get in the ring is actually more humiliating than getting your ass kicked. So, yeah, soak it up, man. Fair. Soak it up. So, okay, we might be denied the delight of watching people who just a couple of years ago thought they could be the prime minister just watch their political careers go up in smoke. And that's going to be a shame. But we can comfort ourselves in knowing that we still have three more weeks of campaigning by the Tories who are too incompetent or too arrogant to be able to read the writing on the wall. And that's going to be so exciting. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Especially because you're like getting rid of all the best politicians in the party first. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> And finally tonight, in story so skeptocratful that we saved it for last just to tease you into thinking that we might not cover it news. <laughs> Whatever <laughs> undercover superhero keeps turning off Donald Trump's teleprompter mid-speech can have all of my money and all of my orifices. It's Eli, by right? the way. Well, yeah, look, this happens way too often for it to be unintentional. If you Google Trump's teleprompter turns off, and then convince Google that you definitely did not mean Trump's teleporter turns off, you will find (laughs) stories from 
all over the fucking country for years. Uh, in March of this year, his teleprompter went out in an Ohio rally after which he told his audience that Joe Biden defeated Obama in an election. In May, his teleprompter went out during a rally in Michigan, uh, mere days after he made fun of Biden for needing a teleprompter, leaving him muttering, quote, we want to have, we want to have great... By the way, it's windy as hell up here, end quote, <laughs> before launching into a bizarre rant about hating the word folks. Okay, but from what we learned in the courtroom, it's windy as hell wherever Trump goes. That's no, just right, a, yeah, he brings it yeah. with him, yeah. Now, and of course, most recently, his teleprompter went out in Vegas, leading him to opine on the relative merits of getting electrocuted to death versus getting eaten <laughs> by a shark. <laughs> It's like he had a script for a sleepover party that it was at. It like flew out the window. He just panicked and he's just like, would you rather eat seven farts or fight a shark? I don't know what to say right now. Yeah. And follow up question. How many sharks would you have to fight before you were alarmed by it? Right. Before you thought it was something unusual. So, yeah. So. You've no doubt seen this one online already, or at least you've seen the torrent of memes that it touched off. Uh, he was in the middle of a rant against electric vehicle requirements when the teleprompter cut out, so he decided to just wing it. So he starts talking about a, a boat manufacturer in South Carolina that he claims to have talked to about electric vehicle requirements, and this imaginary guy was very upset that he had to make electric boats. What? Like, like as opposed to the steam-powered yeah, boats that we right, have now yeah. that never use any electricity. Right, yes, the coal-fired the boats, yeah. Um, so I'll let Trump pick up the story from there. Quote, So I said, let me ask you a question. And he said, nobody ever asked this question. And it must because of MIT, my relationship with MIT. Very smart. Yeah, to be clear, his relationship with MIT is that his uncle taught there. <laughs> okay, are we certain he doesn't mean MIT Romney? That's the relationship well, that he's talking yeah, about sure, there. Okay, now continuing, quote, I say, what would happen if the boat sank from its weight and you're in the boat and you have this tremendously powerful battery and the battery's now underwater what? And there's a shark approximately 10 <laughs> yards over there. Now we're going to need a bigger boat. Fuck, that's Jaws. I, I mean, that's <laughs> so, yeah, so from here, as weird as this is, many in his audience probably thought they knew where he was going. I assure you they did not. He continues, and I swear, <laughs> I am not leaving out any connective tissue here. These are the next words. Quote, by the way, a lot of shark attacks lately. Did you notice that? A lot of shark I watched some what? guy justify it today. Well, they weren't really that angry. They bit off the young lady's leg because of the fact that they were they were not hungry, but they misunderstood what who she was. What is happening? These people are crazy. He said, there's no problem with sharks. They just don't really understand. A young woman swimming now really gets decimated, <laughs> and other people too. A lot of shark attacks. I think wow. we got to build a seawall. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, would you rather uh, handler guy mouthing battery at me? Re right, the battery thing. Yeah. <laughs> so, so yeah, so yeah, his his handler told him, reminded him that he was talking about the boat thing. So he returned to that scenario. Quote: So I said, so there's a shark ten yards from the boat, ten yards, or here, or or zero? <laughs> Did he mean zero <laughs> yards? Like we're inside its guard no, now so and that's the he new was, scenario? He was gesturing 10 yards away, I think. Um, okay. <laughs> he continues, do I get electrocuted? If the boat is sinking, water goes over the battery. The boat is sinking. Do I stay on top of the boat and get electrocuted or do I jump over by the shark and not get electrocuted? Because He's I will- jumping a shark in his speech right now. <laughs> it's amazing. Yes, yes. <laughs> He goes on, because I will tell you, he didn't know the answer. He said, you know, nobody's ever asked me that question. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I said, I think it's a good question. I think there's a lot of electric current coming through the water. So now it's a lightning shark. You know, lots of, <laughs> lots of lightning sharks these days. Have you heard about this? Have you seen this? Lightning sharks? So I don't think for a second this guy didn't know the answer. I think he was just too distracted. Picturing Trump getting eaten by a shark and then picturing Trump getting electrocuted. Right. It's a really fun thing to picture. Like uh -huh. if it's the elect electrocution, you've got his like absurd, co absurd comb over thing, like standing straight up in the air. <laughs> That's fun. <laughs> But if it's the shark, you've got him trying to, like, bop it on the nose with his tiny little hands. That's also a very fun... So, of course, the guy stopped paying attention to everything else right. Trump was saying with those in his mind. Yeah. Look, and as, as if this tortured and deeply stupid point wasn't already impotent enough, 
he undercut his whole fucking scenario by topping it off by saying, quote, but you know what I'd do? If there was a shark or you get electrocuted, I'll take the electrocution every single time I'm not getting <laughs> near that shark, end quote. <laughs> so now I feel like I should end this story with some kind of debunking, but I don't know what I would do. I don't know that he made a point that can be de- debunked. <laughs> it, it would be like trying to argue that Mimsy weren't the Bora Goss. But to be clear, boat batteries are waterproof, right? Because because they're used in boats. Because boats, Cause they, boats, yeah. Boats. They, 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 yeah. Right, yeah, exactly. They have the same basic requirements as electrical components used in submarines, which also have batteries in them. Also, <laughs> if they weren't, the correct answer here would obviously be to fucking electrocute the shark. Dude, read a puzzle. <laughs> uh, the doctor's a woman? The shark's a nurse. I'm lost. I don't know what to do. <laughs> But yeah, that's what happens literally every time this man is asked to speak out loud without being told what to say. Uh, but the upshot, if you're a Trump supporter, is that these teleprompter malfunctions are the only clear evidence we have that the man is literate, right? So at least you have a <laughs> counter argument for that one. Okay. The people standing behind him, their faces in the video as, as he's telling this, yes. to understand, they're just like, what the fuck is about to happen? It's <laughs> oh. priceless. My, my favorite was the white guy trying to hide his face behind a Latinos for Trump sign that he was holding. <laughs> <laughs> so much fun to watch that video. Definitely check it out. And on that note, we're going to close it out. Thanks to No Illusions. Thanks to Michael Marshall. And thanks to all the listeners who liked us and followed us on all the various internets. Please keep doing that, please keep listening, and please keep telling your friends. And if you find the naive stupidity of our giving away free show business model to be oddly charming, you can send us gifts of money at patreon.com slash skeptocrat. Just like Shanna Austin, Cindy Abawi, who can't believe she hasn't done this already, it's the most important podcast I listen to, Stephen, the ghost of Bob Ross, Maeve B., David Watt, Stan Williams, Squiggly Wiggles, Andrew the Public Health Geographer, Dustin Duggar, Chandra, Nicolette Hardinger, Harrison Smith, Chris Kaiser, Donna Kay, Winter Wierkowski, John Fillions, Peter Pa, Torian the Gallant, Natalie Lea Strobel, Sparkling Clean Monkey Man, Miss Shelley Chandler, Stella Liked, Yardbird or Egg, Liam Greenwald, Nick Laus, Joan Ryan, Lust and Leisure Sex Toys, Nat Lavender, Mark H., Bailey Sandlin, Robot Scarecrow, Dark Skies, Frida, Chad Harris, and Policy Wonk, also from Butler, PA. These wonderful people are the other part of Marsha's kink that goes along with demographic charts showing the flight away from the dying Tory party. And our kink, too. We love you. Thank you so much. And whether or not you're feeling financially benevolent like those fine people, if you enjoyed our brand of whimsy and you'd like to hear more dick jokes free of charge, check out our brother and sister shows, The Scathing Atheist, God Awful Movies, D&D minus and citation needed available in all the podcast places. We just have one last thing. Let's compliment that penis. Special thanks to Ryan Slotnick of Evil Giraffes on Mars. He's the creator of the virtuosic musical stylings you heard today, which were used with permission. You should definitely check him out using the links we'll provide or by Googling the only band called Evil Giraffes on Mars. Until next time, catchphrase sign off. Yeah, it's actually really sweet that you're thinking about Anne and Kai and their future. Yeah, that's what love's all about, right? Exactly, exactly. Thinking of others. Ruining the vibes for Eli's Sketchiverse. No, it, it, and your thing, too, with the loving and caring, for sure. No, actually, considering the assets that you were cataloging, I'm guessing Anne's way happier about spiting Eli. They're mint in box, those things. But yeah, no, she she loves spiting Eli. She does. And she does not want my stuff. No, nobody, nobody wants your Do you stuff. want? You don't. Okay, you're saying no right away. Happy Father's Day. <laughs> Thanks, bud. <laughs> the preceding podcast was a production of Puzzle in a Thunderstorm, LLC. Copyright 2024. All rights reserved.